Here we go, Daniel, it's all yours, go ahead. Okay, uh, so this is a quick talk about uh, repository management versus build management and some of the um, uh, not issues necessarily, but some of the friction that um, you know we see when trying to use pulp in a build system context, which is not insurmountable, but you know it's there. And um, so, uh, what what is pulp um, and what is repository management? Um, basically, uh, repositories are the primary object ma manipulation. All content must exist in a repository, and then you tend to add the smallest individual unit of content at any given time to a repository, like a package. Um, and the repository has to be valid at any time, like no matter what change you make, um, version one has to be a valid repository and version two has to be a valid repository. Um, uh, there's sometimes a little bit of a higher conceptual level of abstraction uh, beyond individual packages, though. So, for instance, one spec file can turn into many RPMs when built. And if you build it against multiple architectures, then you have multiple different groups of RPMs. Uh, you know, one group for each architecture. And sometimes you, you want to manage builds rather than individual packages. Um, you want to ensure that either all packages in the build are present or they are not. Um, and interim states where individual packages have been added are undesirable. Uh, you can emulate this with pulp, um, and we do, uh, for instance, copper. Um, but it does involve a bit of additional automation outside of pulp. Um, pulp isn't uh, kind of natively designed around this workflow, and it's an interesting thought exercise to think about uh, what a native, a more native workflow might look like. Um, so as an example, I'm going to use Flat Manager. Uh, Flat Manager is the backend for Flat Hub. It's the uh, primary community Flatpak repository. And um, uh, in addition to being a repository, I believe they also do builds. So it's, it's kind of a, it's like Copper, I think it's a combined build system and uh, community repository tool. Um, so the flat manager workflow is kind of along these lines. So you create a build, uh, you get an ID, you upload artifacts to the build ID. Oh, and by the way, um, I, I recommend reading through this blog post. It's, it's really short, um, and it, it explains it in a little bit more detail than I am. Um, um, you, when you're done with uploading all of the builds, you commit them, uh, or if any of them failed, uh, you purge. Um, if you purge, then all of the builds are uh, uh, basically wiped and nothing's made available to users. Um, if you commit, then uh, a new test repo is created automatically um, so that you can um, uh, test uh, basically your new build. Um, and there's a difference between committing and publishing. So uh, publishing, you know, like in like in pulp, um, is used for things like you know, sign, uh, signing artifacts, which we don't actually do in pulp, um, but you you probably could in theory. Um, Producing derivative artifacts like static deltas, AppStream metadata, and flatback ref files, and uh, calling scripts for customization. Um, but publish itself is also split into two steps. So there is import, uh, importing the build into the mainstream repo, and there is a separate job that's queued for performing repo updates. Um, the purpose for that is, you know, if you were to publish uh, multiple builds at the same time, 
you don't want uh, one of them to overwrite the other one um, in terms of uh, 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 you know what what content is available. If, you know if you if you add build A and then you add build B, you don't want uh, the publish for build B to race with the publish for build A and then like somehow hide one or the other one. You you always want to be adding. Um, and it's kind of analogous to um, in pulp if you were to copy content and then publish repository. Um, but um, uh, FlatHub has a default policy that successful builds are published after three hours um, to the, the mainstream repository. Uh, so you can partially emulate this in pulp. Um, you can, and we do, in copper. Um, you can create a side repository for each build, uh, probably with a one repository version limit because you don't you don't actually care about repository versions. Uh, maybe you do that per arch. Uh, you can upload packages there. You can treat it as, as kind of a, a mutable staging area. You can publish and distribute the staging area within some namespace for test repos. You can copy the contents of those repositories back into the mainstream repository and then delete the side repository. Um, all of that gets you close. Um, there are some small gaps, though. Uh, a minor one is, you know, purging doesn't really exist. Artifacts from deleted repos just become orphaned, and it just kind of gets garbage collected later at some point. Um, if if you're doing builds such that you're kind of expecting them to be unique artifacts um, and not shared with the previous artifacts, uh, it it might be more beneficial to do something like purging, uh, where you are more eagerly deleting stuff that's not going to be made public uh, to the user. Um, so that's just kind of like a uh, storage management detail. Um, but the bigger the bigger issue is that intermediate states always have to be a valid repository because that is what pulp is uh, designed around. It's a repository management tool. Um, so we've baked in the assumption that the intermediate state, you know, always has to be a valid repository. Um, but imagine building a module or something like a module uh, that has cross references. Um, David brought this up in the last talk, you know, multi artifact content. Um, you can't upload a partial content incrementally and then commit it when done and still have it expect everything to work because in pulp, because it's a repository management tool. Every intermediate step also has to be a valid repository. And so if you upload modular packages without the module metadata, you get a broken repository. If you upload the module metadata without all the packages, you get a broken repository. So there's no such thing as a, a partial, uh, partially uh, completed content that you can just continue adding to. Um, and I also know in the container plugin, they have to do something like this to work around the fact that um, uh, they basically have the concept of like pending, um, pending content. So when you're doing an upload of a uh, container image, I I'm probably the wrong person to explain this because I just had it explained to me a few days ago. Um, but if you're uploading a container image, uh, you know, there are blobs and manifest and manifest list um, that all have to be uploaded before you have a valid uh, uploaded container. Um, and it's really the same issue. Um, so the container plugin has to has to build in this concept of pending. That's that's special to them, and um, basically what I'm getting at is 
you know, maybe there is some way we can generalize that and uh, make the container workflow uh, simpler, or the container plugin a little bit simpler, and also um, help out some of the uh, build system management kind of use cases that um, that uh, pull is also being used in nowadays, uh, like Hopper. Um, and that's all I've got. So any questions? Uh, Karen has a comment, Daniel, about Pulp should generate the modular metadata during publish. And my response is you, the module, unlike uh, things like um, say primary XML and RPM land, which can be generated as part of the publish process because you know what, what RPMs are in the repo, the module metadata is content that has to be created and handed to the repo. There's no way for Pulp to know what you want uh, in that context. Is that correct? Would you verify that? Yeah, but but why? Why can't I tell Pulp these packages in this repository should end up in this module and then generate it should be named this, generate the metadata for me? Because there's a lot more than this in a module. There's a lot that goes into a module. Well, my point we is could. that is that is what you do. Yeah. But the fact is like you can't have the module um, and also have references to packages that aren't uploaded yet. Exactly. Then the module isn't valid. Yeah. Um, although modularity is kind of not a great example because the RPM ecosystem is moving away from modularity. So um, yeah, I just use it as an example because there are others. Yeah. Um, there are definitely others. Exactly right. Exactly right. Other questions for Daniel? Ryan. Um, I really appreciate what you talked about here. Um, do you have a sense of, we didn't talk about solutions and I, I don't, I'm trying to avoid it, but do you have a sense of if there's an info path Say again, Brian, I missed that. Mental path towards the types of solutions that you for this, or is. Uh, so yep. you're breaking up a lot, Brian. Uh, what I, the, the part I heard was, is there an incremental path towards uh, uh, supporting that workflow? Um, I don't know. I actually don't know that much about what the container plugin is doing uh, just yet. Um, I'm just kind of learning about it now, um, for instance. So I don't know how much we can bridge um, uh, the workflows together. Um, uh, my main point is just that you know, if if you have a repository management tool and your assumption that's baked in is that every everything you do to a repository has to be its own valid repository and there's no concept of like a, 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 a temporary um, invalid state, um, then there are certain scenarios um, like this multi-artifact or, or multi-object content with all these cross-references that are kind of hard to uh, put together. Um, and it, it becomes a, a bigger issue if you're talking about, you know, uh, a build system like you know, Topper or something where they want all of these cross references tying these uh, packages together, um, and not just, um, uh, you know, thinking in terms of individual packages. Um, and it's not just, you know, it's not just like the Copper, of course, it's 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 other plans as well. Thanks. So, I hear you, Matthias. Maybe I can just add for the container where you said 
the um, everything you said is okay, is all right. That's okay though. It's it's fine. Um, there are there were certain um, considerations. The thing is, uh, a container usually contains about uh, consists of some, as in maybe a lot of blobs, and all these blobs need to be uploaded uh, individually. And so when you call container push, then the command will start pushing blobs to the repository, and in the end will kind of do the commit call by pushing the manifest that references all the blobs. And in a way, this never creates an invalid repository because you can have blobs that aren't referenced. But with pulp, it imposed the problem that with every single blob, a, a new repository version was created. And that meant a lot of repository versions that were kind of not meaningful. And also right. creating repository yeah. versions cannot happen in parallel while uh, Podman and Container uh, and Docker push want to push in parallel. And this was kind of solved by the um, pending blob, where we just take the blob associated with the repository and not as already content in the repository, just content available to the repository. And then with the manifest, all this content would be moved into the next con uh, repository version as one atomic operation. So for container, this also solved a very serious performance issue. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly yeah. that's exactly kind of the pattern I'm talking about. So like in the yeah. copper case, you know, you might want to build uh, a dozen RPMs from one spec file. You don't want to upload them individually because then you get 12 different non-meaningful repository versions. Um, you can kind of emulate it by uploading them into a separate repository and then copying everything over and deleting your separate repository. Um, but you know, I wonder if there is value, like in the container case, of kind of um, moving that workflow into you know what pulp has available um and not just kind of building it on top like like uh copper does for instance karen uh yeah i, I was gonna say in pulp Dep we have this idea proposal whatever you want to call it i think we talked about it last pulpcon as well um to have a kind of sub repository concept so version sub repositories in pulp depth and they would have a similar kind of issue as you've been describing because if you synchronize and the question becomes like what if one of the sub repositories synchronizes successfully and creates a new sub repository version but another one does not so the overall sync failed and then you need to roll back that sub-repository version that you now don't want because you only want it if the whole sync or the sync as a whole is successful. Um, that well, my, first of all, this is just sort of off the top of my head. Does that sound like a similar kind of challenge, or is that something different conceptually? Um. I'm not sure I followed that quite well enough to to give a solid answer. Um, certainly, uh, certainly, like if you have a, a sub repository, I can definitely imagine, uh, you know, validity issues uh, with with like um, trying to keep everything well formed. And, and also making changes. I mean, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't. I didn't quite follow all. Of that. So I think the 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 idea is, if I try to explain it better, maybe uh, that each sort of pulp repository or each app repository in pulp Dep actually consists of a reference to several sort of sub repository versions. 
Um, and then if you synchronize, you would need to synchronize each of the sub repositories. And then the, yeah, the challenge becomes like creating the overall new repository version if only some of the sub repositories sort of completed a new version successfully. But so, so the, the similarity is that you have this whole question of what happens if you have kind of intermediary objects that aren't meaningful on their own, but are waiting for some other thing to complete. And what happens if that other thing doesn't complete, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's some overlap there, probably. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know if we will ever find the time to actually do this. It would have some big architectural advantages for PulpDep, but uh, yeah, it's still an idea. It's not planned. Yeah. Um, I think it all kind of falls into the composability of stuff. So in the container world, you have the blobs and blobs compose or are kind of composed together by a manifest. Then with RPM, you have the individual packages and a build will compose them into one meta content unit. And in the end, after all, a repository version is also some kind of a big meta content type that just contains a lot of other content. Is that going into your direction, Kirin? I guess, yes. I mean, you could think of a source package which contains three files as a really small repository that contains three files, right? Right. Or at least conceptually, there's a similarity there. You have one thing that's composed of several other things. And yes. at, and one, at one point, you hit save on the whole overall object. Yeah, and the idea of only having a valid big repository version would then break down to you compose only about uh, only out of other next level valid uh, content meta meta content types. Does that make any sense? I think it comes back to one of the comments that Daniel made early on, which is the observation that pulp is designed around the idea that its job is to present fully complete, if you will, correct consumable repositories to people doing installs. That's what it, that's what it's for. And all of the conversation we're having here is like, you know, three things in a tar file could be considered a repository. That tar file could be considered a repository. Um, but it's not correct in the context of it has all the things that you need to be able to make that installable on some faraway system. And the concept that, that we're kind of toying with here is how do we loosen or, or make possible in pulp to the end to the user who's producing content, who's doing these builds, the ability to say, I'm going to put this stuff in a repository knowing that the repository is incomplete or incorrect and that's okay. And have some automatic way to go, okay, now I think my repository is good enough that it can be, they can go through all the rules. Like RPM, for example, has rules when you create a new repository version. And if, if the, the new version doesn't, you know, match all those rules, then you're going to get errors. Um, this would be a much looser, whatever you want goes in because you haven't pushed the big button that says, okay, now apply all the rules that make this valid in Pulp's current context, um, current, current, um, not context, current architectural goal. Dan, is that, does that state that, that, that concept that you kind of started off with here? Did I state that correctly? Uh, yes. Uh, the only thing I'd add to that is that, you know, uh, all these other systems also are like, th there are rules that they only present to the user um, mm -hmm. valid um, repositories and stuff. But mm -hmm. internally, you know, they do have these states where you can, um, that are incomplete and then you commit and then it runs through the, ch the checks. 
exactly um, right. And and in, in pulp because we started as a as a repository management tool, um, uh, we didn't start with that assumption. Yeah. So that's that's really the only uh, the main friction. Cool. Um, um, I also just to reiterate, you know, I really recommend reading the the blog post and I just linked it in the chat because um, it does explain it better than probably I did. Um, I, I debated just scrolling through the blog post in as my talk, um, but you know, <laughs> you guys can can look at it on your own time. Because cool. I think it does a good ex a good re a good job of explaining what they do and why they do it that way. Um, in the context of Flatpak, of course, but, you know. Um. Very cool. Other comments? Like Matthias, you were going to say something? I put it in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Even in pulp file, I will point out, Matthias. I mean, pulp file is kind of a glorified tar file, but even in pulp file, if I want to have the same binary in a pulp file as in the SHA-256 is the same, but I want to have it have four different names, I don't think that works currently because we say, oh, we already have that SHA-256. What do you want it twice for? Um, that's an example of a rule that makes sense, except it doesn't. Um, well, you will have four different content units but that's that should be possible do we i'm not sure that, that it upload we'll have to look i know i've 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 been talking to somebody relatively recently the last couple of months where that had issues because of this um anyway this is this uh, the the general approach here is the interesting change is can we uh come up with a, a consistent mechanism so that for example pulp container doesn't have to do its own thing and then dev doesn't have to do its own thing to address this idea of i want to have a, a a place i can manipulate and play with and then eventually have a magic button that says okay now apply all of the consistency rules that make it make it uh the thing that pulp likes to present to users i think it's a fine idea other comments here All right. Um, actually, Daniel, I am going to stop the recording because this was actually really useful as its own thing. Um, yesterday, we just had all the lightning talks as one big recording. I'm just going to stop this one so it's a separate one, um, and then open up and see if we want to do uh, we want to do more today or not. All right. Are you ready for me to stop? Sure. All right, sir. Hang on a moment.